Let me make an introduction now first uh, for, the, for the people who are watching this on camera or whatever. Is, uh, I want to introduce our new uh, facilities chairperson, Mr. Hooper, who's been with us uh, many, many years. I'm honored for you to step up and accept the role of facilities chair. It's a huge responsibility, and I think you're highly capable to do an outstanding job. And also, Mr. Laughlin, who is only as his board makes movements. Uh, I like to believe we put our talents where they belong, and uh, I'd like to appreciate you also to be on this committee. It's a huge, huge responsibility, as you can see, as we move through this process. It's, uh, there's a lot to be done through this committee. So, uh, with that being said, done. Welcome. Okay, we'll uh, call the uh, meeting to order. This is a meeting of the Augsburg Bridge and Port Authority Facilities Committee. Uh, it's Wednesday. June 11th, 2014, approximately five minutes after 8 a.m. And first item on the agenda is a contract with Majeski and Masters uh, regarding bridge inspection. And if you go to your, click on your link here, you'll see that. Wade, would you like to take us through that? Certainly, good morning. Um, the first item is uh, approval of a contract with Majeski and Masters. As you know, we have uh, biennial inspections, and the 2014 uh, biennial inspection is uh, upcoming. The purpose of it is a structural inspection uh, report, and a load rating review is mandated by New York State DOT. Uh, two proposals were received, one from Majeski and Masters and one from Greenman Peterson. Majeski and Masters uh, came in at 163,410 and uh, therefore we're recommending that uh, we proceed with Majeski and Masters for fee not to exceed that amount. One thing that occurred to me as I looked at this and, and looking at the recent cost history, there's quite a jump there. Um, I can answer that for you, Mr. Chairman. Um, if you'll notice on, the, on, on item three, Go right to the bottom of that. There's a this year. There's a New York State DOT required gusset plate load rating, and that that has an added cost in there. Um, so if if you back that out, um, you're probably looking at 130 thousand for uh, cost this year on that. But if you on the item three there, uh, the gusset plate load rating came out of the Minnesota uh, bridge collapse, and uh, it's something that's been out there that we needed to uh, take care of. So the state um, had requested that we do that and uh, uh, get them the information on those, uh, on that uh, item of the bridge. So that was something that I included in the whole thing. So yeah, that, um, an important thing too. Yeah. We all know about the bridge. So. Steve, as, as we look through a, a new sequence of things like this, how will this cost be every year? I mean, are we going to be up and around 150, 175 thousand dollars every year now for inspections? Or we well, when we went to well, like in, in recent history, um, it was kind of um, I don't know. Um, we went to an RFP process back in like 2006 or 2007, six, yeah, six. and that kind of that kind of calmed things down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I think too, the state's been more active. Um, with trying to meet federal standards. So things change. Um, in, in fact, we're going over with a different federal standard for 2000 and the next uh, would be 2016 for us. Um, and I don't know how that'll affect it, but it's a different way of recording everything. So um, I would say because of the bridge collapse and the, and the issue federally with bridges, um, there's been a lot of engineering changes and things like that that have added cost um, with how we've got to account for those things, both with uh, diving inspections and things like that. Um, Mr. Chairman, that was another one too. This year, there's um, every four years we do an underwater inspection. So it, you'll notice every other year it bounces up a little bit. So that, that might be another reason for it. But there's just probably in the last seven or eight years, there's been a lot of um, things that come at us that we have to have our consultant um, make sure that they take care of on, on that. But I think it leveled out when we went to RFP because we had competition. But I, I have noticed in recent RFPs 
we're only getting those people that have done work for us before. I think um, some of the firms, either they're too far away or um, they've got such a high overhead, they, they, they know they can't compete, so they don't even uh, bother putting in a proposal. Yeah. Uh, we have a tiger grant. That application is pretty uh, uh, resourceful at this point in time. Is any of those costs that we like that? We no, have, these we have are to eat, we have to not grant eligible costs. And the disturbing thing about this, uh, in particular, is these uh, special emphasis items that come up um, at one time were special emphasis and then would go away. Uh, but now the special emphasis items are coming and they are staying. So they're adding additional costs, like gusset plates, for example. That part of the inspection is never going to go away, uh, in, in my opinion. I mean, it could. But that continues to drive up the cost. And as there are various items that happen with other bridges, this is a cost that I see is going to continue to increase um, because of the different um, inspection requirements that we have um, just by the nature of what's going on in the rest of the transportation. Um, and another one, and, and kind of going to Wade's point, I put money in there for a follow-up <coughs> inspection. So it depends on how everything gets through. If we were 100% fine, um, the state wouldn't require us next year to come up and just look at everything that, if there's nothing to look at, then we, that would go away. But we found that um, after every inspection, there's work we do this year that will have to be looked at next year. Maybe if they come up for a day or two and review all of our repairs and then put out a report to the state saying, this is how it was done and it was done correctly. So we've had to include a special inspection the following year, and that's in this uh, pricing. So an inspection like this, <clears throat> obviously there's a checkoff list of type of things that are engineering detailed that I probably would understand, load factors and things like that. Is that judged by the hours they figure it's going to take to do the inspection? Uh, yeah. And or is it just an overall, they say they, they appraise it, make a decision, okay, this is... I think they have, I wonder they have field hours, hours and then they have office hours. So there's, like you say, they'll take measurements, and then to put this all together and in a form um, requires a lot of back office stuff that's involved in that, putting together photos and matching things, and then having to write a description of maybe, I, I'm sure, if, um, but for example, they start right from the beginning of the bridge with, a, with our bucket truck, and they check every light head, um, guide rail, everything. You don't think of this as the bridge, but that's part yeah. of it. So they go all the way up through there, and then they go to the back side. They check all the everything in there. Um, and I think it's a factor of what they spend in field time and also back office time with that. Well, I was wondering if, you know, they, they've been our bridge people other than uh, Greenfield, which <coughs> has, uh, you know, doing the center span or whatever just recently. But if they were really the higher bit, we might have <coughs> even considered them because they know our bridge better than anybody. But that would have, could have happened. Uh, that would necessarily go that route, but well, I mean, if there was, yeah, if, if I, I know we did that before, I think we did that before. If, we, if they were like, say, there was a fifteen thousand dollar difference or something, and they were higher, and you and you, we like, for whatever reasons, we decided we wanted somebody else in there this year, just to have different eyes on the bridge, and that's kind of where we went when we first started with the RFPs. That. Uh, Greenman Peterson came in, and they did a couple inspections. Then they did the uh, engineering yeah. there. Well, it, did, didn't we switch a couple yeah. years yeah. back? Four and or five we, years we back? came back to Mackenzie. Right, and we wanted somebody else to look at the right. bridge in a different way, with different set of eyes and uh, yeah. engineering skills or something, whatever we talked about. And then we came back to these folks. Again. And uh, the reason Greenman Peterson was higher is um, on the gusset plate inspection, um, they had to go to a. Um, they use Ahmed and Whitney. So they're bringing in another subcontractor um, for that. So um, that's quite a bit higher, but um, I don't have any detail of. It. And Almond Whitney's based out of New York City. They're, they they do good work, but they're they're kind of a premium uh, engineering firm. So I because I asked, well, you know, I just asked them if they break down some of their costs. You know, I, I become analytical and I think of two dollars and seventy five cents. You know, the car is over. How much that two dollars and seventy-five cents do I end up with? I mean, here's a hundred and sixty-three thousand dollars that goes toward that two dollars and seventy every year. You know, and all those type of things that go in. So, what what are the two dollars and seventy-five cents do I really put in my pocket at the end? Right. Quite interesting. Yeah. yeah. 
quite interesting. It, yeah. Everybody's nibbling at it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, I think just so you know, neither Majeski and Masters nor Greenman Peterson is an MWBE. We did in the bid process put that requirement in. Uh, I spoke with folks at Majeski and Masters uh, about the importance of it, and they do have a couple of subs that they will be using that will put them up to the 20%. Good. So yeah. we, does that one of those categories we ask for a waiver? We could ask for a waiver, or we could ask them to use um, uh, subs. We asked them to use subs, and they did. It's much easier to get than a waiver. A waiver would be hard to get because they in Albany would say there is a company somewhere that will do it in, in New York State that is okay. certified. They did give you a percentage, right? Yes. Somewhere between 15 14 and percent. And then yeah. they said they could get there with another one, and I said, we'll get the other one too. Yeah. Good. Same one. Excellent. Any other discussion? Uh, we'll entertain a motion. Yeah, I'll make a motion to uh, uh, move it to the full board. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Move forward. Thank you. Uh, second item is a truck uh, purchase. This is a replacement of a piece of equipment. A, uh, this replaces a Chevy at the port. Or, I'm sorry, at the airport. <coughs> Not much to say here. It's a, a new truck with a plow. Replacing aging vehicle. It's uh, from a certified WBE vendor. Uh, total cost twenty eight thousand six ninety four oh nine, and we do have funds available in the budget to cover the expenditure. Steve, I had a discussion with Wade yesterday. Uh, you have a two thousand truck that pushes some snow around. That's just taking care of the road and the little parking lot areas and stuff like that. Yeah, it, and over by the uh, it does the GA side when you know not with the heavy snow you can only go so far because yeah. it's so far to plow but it'll like in the morning we've got to just to get people into the terminal and and moving around um, it's, while they're out there doing the uh, runway it's much easier just to uh, <coughs> take care of our area and just um, get really morning time and then some cleanup um, and it's pretty handy with slush and things on the runway you can run down that. Uh, you know, on a 32 degree day, you can take care of a lot so that, you know, you kind of move the slush around and then uh, the runway will, will uh, it'll bear up a lot easier. But that 2000, and 2000 pickup has been kind of passed down from here to the port and out the airport. It's, um, and it, it's done its job, but it's pretty well, uh, it's still road legal. But the plow part and everything, it's not reliable. I thought that was your new truck. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were getting a new truck. Whatever you want me to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question we had was, you know, I mean, we start to think about our process and we're trying to move forward with, you know, with, uh, you know, a bigger airplane coming into the, you know, to the airport. And all of a sudden, that plane, the people are waiting, it's, it's a big difference between nine people waiting and 150 people waiting, whatever you say. We have this new snowblower. We just arrived right here just yeah. recently, yeah. and uh, so, so I was wondering if this truck would be uh, anywhere that in here would uh, be an asset to to snow removal on the runway also. But you would probably would never put this truck on the runway. You can in certain yeah. circumstances. That's what I was trying to say. But it it's more um, more of an auxiliary thing to help you out to to bear it bear up the roadway rather than. Um, I found that like when there's slush, the big plow, as much as it tries, it doesn't do as good a job as removing slush, and especially with a new paved surface. So sometimes if we make four passes up and back, that center thing, it'll the sun will hit it and it, it, and it bears up quicker than <coughs> just leaving it or trying to do it with the big plow. So when you're but not we don't you know it's it might be you might not do it for a couple weeks, but but the other thing is is it's. It's kind of uh, something I need for the other parts of the airport, yeah. and that that was one of the reasons I'm replacing that. It's just kind of what you're going to is that in the future we're going to need we're going to need some. Well, that's why I wondered if we need a bigger truck. No, I got the V plow. On what this you going to use for the port? Uh, excuse me. What truck are you going to use for that? I thought we had a big truck for the plow, right? Yes, we do. We yeah. we do them. Uh, 
port access road with the guys that plow here, and then we have a, a 1990, 1992 international plow we use on the bridge in the summer, then we put the plow and the sander on that for down there. And that's uh, been adequate. That's worked really well for us down there. You know, something just kind of hit me a little bit with, uh, you know, if the Legionnaire comes here or whatever, they fly at later hours. And, you know, that's snow removal, one of those things in later hours is going to be an issue. Yeah, you know, and it's ready to can move snow. And and when you've got X amount of passengers, not nine in a Cape Air thing where they can say, well, and it's a, you know, a pretty important thing. It's going to be, we're going to have to put a pretty good focus on that to be prepared. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're thinking those type of things. And, that you know, that um, and one thing Wade asked me is, what are we going to do with the old snowblower? Um, I was talking to the gentleman that brought up our new one, and he's seen where um, if you take the snowblower part, which is pretty well spent on that, he thinks you can retrofit that with a sweeper, and and you yeah, know it, so. you know at big airports, um, a sweeper can be real valuable too. So I haven't really decided. I originally I was thinking, well, let's see what we can get for it. But after talking to him, I'm thinking I'd like to look into maybe retrofitting that with a sweeper, depending on where we head here. I mean, it yeah. isn't, it's nothing we have to go for right away, but that's kind of where we're headed with that. Well, I just think. <coughs> Amount of extra you got to plow at uh, 1,200 feet by 150. That's a lot of square footage or whatever that you got yeah. uh, to do. do but I, I can see down in the future if you know if, if we get that 150, 160, 170 passenger plane in there, they might need another plow. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. You know, but a I, smaller I, thing to, to keep that because that's going to be vital. You know. The entrance way in and stuff around that and, terminal. And I'm anticipating yeah. when we go through this winter with the new snowblower, I really think um, if you when we see what this snowblower can do, I think it's going to do a lot more than we ever used. What we used to use the old snowblower for, I think you can actually remove snow in a hurry with that thing. It's good. So that's my expectation, and that's what we want to try mm -hmm. to do. So maybe with the with that with our regular plow and the snowblower, we might be able to be able to take care of them. That's where the sweeper thing also came into to that. But to your, to your point, Doug, our equipment needs are going to change as the yeah. activity level increases, definitely. Yeah. Well, that's that's a concern here. I mean, are you buying the right piece of equipment I mean, for what you really want? In this for? case, in this case, yes. But I'm just trying to give you an overview. Of, I'm aware of kind of what you, where you're headed with that. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's just part of the discussion here. I mean, we want to we want you to have the equipment that you should have, not just because the price is right. Yeah, and I, I yeah. kind of glossed over it, but I, normally we just get a regular plow that goes like this, but we found we would do a lot more with a V plow, so yeah. that added a little more cost to this. So, oh, okay. So we did upgrade to a V plow. Now, Chevy, you went from a Chevy to a Ford? Just that, to that was what was on the state contract. State contract? Some years it's strictly Dodge or Ford. Okay. Um, the other thing what added a little more cost was we we're right in it between model year changes, so it, it might have come down a little bit if we got to 2014. What year is this? This is a 2015. Oh, yeah, they just changed the whole yeah. structure. Yeah, uh, I got this price back in March, oh. and they said uh, they were closing out production in 2014. Oh, okay. So we were too late for that. So. In effect, they said you got to take a 2015. Yeah, this is a huge uh, model change. In yeah, so, so we'll be on the front end of the, the 2015. Yeah. Yeah. I see you're getting the undercoating on it too. Yeah, that was something the board yeah. had always yeah. um, stressed, yeah. and that will help us. Yeah. Did you turn on with that? Uh, one point. other question. Yeah. I remember at one time we had a question about a flex fuel requirement. Are we okay here with this? Yeah, it's E85. That um, everything on state contract kind of specifies that for flex fuel, they call it. Um, well, meet that BART requirement if they're on the state contract. And we don't have to really lose our minds over that. It's there. No, it's kind of got to be a standard on the state contract. Good. Uh, Mr. Lamashi? Yeah, I, I moved up. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 We're going to move this. Thank you. Uh, the next item is a contract with uh, Tisdale Associates. This is for the uh, basically putting out to bid uh, 
and engineering services associated with the dry type sprinkler service in this building. Uh, the cost would be not to exceed $9,500. Steve, anything you want to comment on, on this particular end? Background on that, um, the, the cost is, um, when you're dealing with uh, fire extinguishers and fire systems, um, the engineering and that <coughs> reliability drives that up. I mean, uh, honestly, I was a little surprised it was that high, but I asked them about that, and there's probably a four or $5,000 um, amount in there just for designing you know, and stamping and a sprinkler system. And just so you know, it's dry type because it's not heated up there and basically it's empty until something happens, then it calls for water. Well, what's happened is over the years with condensation and heat up there, moisture gets it got into the, a lot of the piping and, and it got so that when we go to test it now, everything clogs and, and the pipes are rotting you know they look fine but the interior they with moisture and everything so um uh, probably the last year and a half we've been having we've had trouble passing that there and right now um as it works there it it needs it has to be replaced so we're basically um and we've had a price for that before and we think that's somewhere in the 25 to 30 thousand uh, dollar range so once the engineering's out we hope to do that this summer What if we did nothing? Uh, we'd be in violation of fire. But I mean, how did this all come about? Do um, we know that there's a problem up there? I mean, I mean yeah, I the last, you just said. Well, um, we have a firm that does uh, biennial, no, four times a year, comes around. It does all the industrial park. we kind of got a checklist of oh, places okay. that they do. And this, this one right here is the only one that they haven't been able to pass with flying colors. And... Um, Basically, they they're saying they you know it won't pass, so we're covered in the heated areas. But when it gets up to there, we're we're in violation of fire code, so it needs to be taken care of. But we've done some things and kind of gotten by in the past, but if, if we can't we can't get around that anymore. You know, like replaced a piece that we thought was real bad and it's still failing. So um, it's just something that an old building, you know, it's an old building and another added thing to this uh, the operation of this building so this is the upper floor yeah it's just how many how many sprinklers are we talking oh i don't know the count in there probably well, it just hangs there and it's all through the upper part of oh, the attic oh that's the pipe hanging down uh in the attic there's a oh black, in the attic it's all in the attic oh Everything's it's all in the attic, attic. yeah oh. but all of these are fine the building's fine oh okay and they in the operational sim, but part of code requires that we have the, we've got the fire sprinklers in the uh, attic. Seventy-five so hundred dollars is a scary number for that. Yeah, I mean, I look and see exactly what they're getting for what we get for ninety-five hundred dollars. I mean, I just my opinion. I don't know, but it seems pretty steep for me. It, it well, is. I look and see how they build it. But yeah, I found that when we we designed the uh, sprinkler system for building eleven, Wade, remember the high pile. Um, it, but when you have to have an engineer stamp on a safety issue like that, it just it's a premium that you pay for. It. Well, that's the interesting thing here is it's not just the ninety five hundred dollars at the end of the day. At the end of the day, you're going to have somewhere uh, probably north of forty thousand dollars invested in the yeah. uh, sprinkler system in the attic. But you know, it's one of the one of the challenges of an old building. <laughs> if, it's, if it's not that, it's boiler. Yes, the roof. <coughs> well, it's a fully utilized building, and obviously we have to protect the safety of our clients. They're well involved. There's no question about it. Right. We can't risk that. But I, I'm just interested in how things are done. It's like, yeah. <laughs> well, it's the process. Yes. It's and we can get that uh, television show that does ghost busting to come and pay for the uh, <laughs> to do some inspections up there and maybe cover it up. I haven't seen that. <laughs> I haven't seen that. No. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm glad. I guess. I guess the first thing is, I'm glad we're on top of something that's an issue that uh, is important that we need to take care of. If something ever happened, you say, "Well, wait a minute. We didn't. We didn't do this. That's that." Whatever. Yeah, and, and just you know, we, we try to make an attempt to yeah. to keep things 
together, but this is just one of those things we can't, we have no other alternative than to replace it. Yeah, I'd rather take that money to another mall or something, you know? <laughs> 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 really, it's funny you think about I things, know. money yeah, that you're going to use that. for this, and all of a sudden this comes yeah, up, you're going yeah. to in your pockets right. again, you know? Right. Yeah. It was budgeted also, though. That's another thing. It was in my budget. Um, I think was? we, what was it? We had 35 yeah, in there. Something in there for, so yeah. we, we oh, hope that will yeah. come along. Okay. So it was budgeted. All right. I'm surprised. Any further discussion? All of that. Okay. okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. I move forward to the full board. Good morning, Frank. Good morning, Frank. So, uh, for the next item, let's go ahead and talk about the airport for a minute. Um, let's walk through the existing sign. Um, on the board here, there's a picture of the existing airport sign. So, you know what we're talking about. What we have here is a, a sign that's a, two, it's a double sided sign. The thought is we're going to take this sign off, split it in half, put one half on the airport, uh, one half on the air side, one half on the land side of the terminal, uh, reuse this existing uh, pedestal right here, and mount a uh, rectangular digital display, uh, similar to what we have on, on the, the bridge. Um, specifically, the mechanics of this The sign uh, would be purchased through uh, the sign manufacturer is Fiberdyne uh, Labs. The preferred uh, New York State has a preferred uh, vendor program, which is Herkimer Industries. So we would be buying the sign through Herkimer Industries, who's buying it from Fiberdyne for the sign itself. There is a double. Uh, sided lit header and installation that we would be buying directly from Fiber 9 that's not under the, uh, the state contract. Total cost for this sign would be $66,000 and change. Uh, there is uh, funds budgeted for that. Specifically to look at what this sign is, there's some uh, schematics here under the backup. I'll go ahead and Click on it here. So what this sign would be again? There's that. Uh, if you can see my my cursor here on the on the uh, screen, the cement um, pedestal would be retained. There would be a, a series of panels uh, in, installed. Basically, uh, four block panels that are uh, three by three to match the sign. That's uh, thirty. It's basically three feet high by 12 feet and change wide. And on top of that would be a um, Ogdensburg International Airport. That's the blue and white background, similar to what you saw on the other side. So the digital portion of the sign is the, the lower part. Uh, that's the $52,000 and change. The upper part is the $11,000 and change from five million. This would allow displays uh, uh, similar to uh, what we have at the uh, bridge. So the question that I had for Wade was the format and being, or being square or whatever it is, the format here is going to be utilized to maybe explain the side panels. Yeah, one of, the, one of the issues that we have with the sign out here is we didn't know what we didn't know when we wanted to get this thing. So what we designed was we designed a DOT type sign that was a square in the largest footprint that we could get. Well, the problem is most things in digital media are rectangular in format. So every time we go to put up an ad, we have some uh, some rework that we have to do on the um, sign here at the uh, at the bridge. It's minor stuff, but it you know it does take about 10, 15 minutes each time you want to each time you want to do it. This sign does not have that same issue because it's rectangular and it's uh, three foot high, twelve foot long. So we won't have that uh, that rework that needs to go on. It's too bad that wasn't pushed back more. If you're going out towards Jubilton, you come upon that sign that's there now, real quick and. The fence that Levins has there, kind of, you know, you don't see it till you almost get up to the yeah. road. You know what I'm saying? You're seeing more toward Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. That was right in, in 
when we did the terminal, that was considered a wet area. <laughs> Sorry. <Okay. but laughs> no, I just, we, you know, right. I'm, I'm right. just figuring this. I mean, at least here, you're coming across the bridge and you, you, you can see it, you know. It's some people are going to go to the cemetery and turn around, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm or, just, you know, it's. Yeah. Well, it's eight foot high from the top to mm -hmm. go up. You know, it's just tough to think about. Eight, eight feet, you know, it's yeah. pretty high. Yeah. You're higher up than what you got. But you're right. You know, what you have to see. Yeah, so by comparison on the photo you see on the uh, on the wall here, this thing is, is going to come up to right about here in crust. Okay. So it's a little bit, uh, it's a uh, rectangular sign, <coughs> even uh, with the pedestal. The only question I have, gentlemen, is the idea, are we a little ahead of ourselves, you know, waiting to see what happens uh, next week in the, in the process? But on the other side of the coin, are we are we being progressive in a way that okay, with essential air service, you know, continuing on that we're you know promoting our airport, and all those type of things, and the visual aspect, whatever, uh, you know, is the timing right for that? Because that's going to change your you know have a thing, whatever. Maybe you can make well, a recommendation to it. With that with that size of a sign, is that going to take care of what we possibly need down the roadway? Oh, absolutely. Um, um, delivery on this thing is about six to twelve weeks from the, from the time we place the order. Um, you know, obviously, we don't want to be out there trying to install it October, November, December. That, that time just uh, doesn't doesn't, uh, doesn't work. Um, one thing I did forget to mention: this sign also has a um, reinforced frame as well, just like the one that we have out here. Because again, here at the airport, we've got some pretty heavy-duty winds out there on occasion. And the last thing we want to be doing is picking up the sign out of the field somewhere. So that'll that'll announce and, and stuff with any, like our flight patterns in and all what yes. times canceled, not canceled. Yeah, we'll be able to. There's two ways to control it. We'll be able to control it uh, either directly here from the office, or you'd be able to, you know, worst case scenario, our network here is down. You'd be able to walk right up to it and plug into it and upload. It. You enjoyed the summer, didn't you? <laughs> so they won't have any any control inside the terminal on this side. Uh, not at this point. When we do the terminal expansion, um, odds are we'll have some better communication than what we have out there right now, and be able to control it uh, right there. Uh, what the plans are now is to basically drop Time Warner feed to it, and that way it's networked, and we can just add it to the same. Um, the same fiber dyne system that controls our two signs out here. It's actually our bridge sign is uh, uh, basically two separate signs smushed together. <coughs> this is one one sign that displays the same thing on both sides. So there's one there, there's one computer in this sign as opposed to two that are up here. Wait, I think you made a very interesting point. If we ordered it the day we ordered it, it takes about you say. It's going to take about six to twelve weeks plus um, coordinating the installation. All right. So, let's like say if we ordered it now, uh, we'll be looking at uh, maybe August, July, August, somewhere yeah, there. Probably into September. By the time we coordinate everything for installation. So. Well, I mean, even if we, I don't know. I I, I love the idea. I, I'm really for this 100. percent I just wondered if if we ought to wait just a little bit. To do this, you know, to see exactly how it all formats. I'm just putting a question out there. I didn't say I agree with what I said, but you know, it's like, what do we, what do we need to think about here? And spend sixty-six thousand dollars to find out we don't have a goal. You know what I'm saying? So, do we want, do we want this sign for the airport or for promotion of our next level of service? Well, keep in mind too. There's one other thing that this does, and that's this existing sign. It's taken off the pedestal, split, and put on our ter on our existing terminal. Like right now, if you come in by plane, you have no idea where you even are. There's no welcome to Hogginsburg. Yeah, I, I understand all that. I mean, I, I, I mean, I agree with this. I mean, I, I was all for this from the get-go, but I'm just thinking, you know, I knew this was going to happen, but I didn't know if it was going to happen at this timetable. You know, if this is too soon, too late. What do you guys think? You okay? I, I'm, I'm okay, as long as it's big enough to handle what we're going to need down the road with yeah. with the Legion and, and whatever other airlines might, you know, I wouldn't want to get it and then all of a sudden, two years later when we're going down the hall, say, geez, we 
we need that you know a little bit bigger yeah. sign to to put this this and well, this on. Right? I mean, uh, some of the things I think about regional council and the lattice working on you know some grant money and stuff like that. I, I don't know maybe if, if that falls under any, any of those type of formats. You say this is what we want to have happen. You know, we're going to improve the terminal. We're going to do this, that, whatever. Um, I'd rather spend you know some of that money toward the sign than spend a road for take care of the attic sprinkler system. Yeah. Or See? unfortunately this isn't <laughs> See, the, your attic sprinkler system. <laughs> See I guess I, I look at it, I re I'd rather if, if it's budgeted, I'd rather do it now. And then maybe down the road within this grant money or the terminal we might have money to buy a new sweeper that he might need out there. Uh, that's all right. That's a good deal. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, the sign isn't something that's uh, grant eligible either under the FAA or any other type of uh, grant. So, why would you let me say that? Why would you let me say that? <laughs> Kick me under the Sorry. table. Kick me under the table or something. Give me a clue. Yeah. I, I wish there was. <laughs> okay. I wish there was. That, very that good promotion. Being the case, I think we do need this sign. I do too. And it's budgeted. I just Probably put thought out there time for and I'm a yeah. positive yeah. thinker. We are going to get what we're looking for. There, I'd like that. Oh. I agree. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll move the resolution. I'll okay. sign. Okay. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So we're moving this. Okay. Uh, in the Commerce Park, we have a contract with Cornerstone Services. Um, the uh, map in front of you is actually relates to the next item for development authority of the North Country Fiber Optic, but uh, it does have building numbers on it. And this is for Building 12, which is uh, the former Jack and Jill uh, Daycare Center. Red Roof. Red Roof. Red roof. Right. In the center. <laughs> Red Roof. Yeah. So I think what we're going to end up doing with this diagram is uh, I think we're going to scavenge this and replace our other uh, photocopy 1980. So what this is for, um, this is for replacement of an HVAC unit. There were four, um, four bidders on this. The lowest bidder was a cornerstone that's 66, 28, 42. And based on these costs, uh, we're recommending uh, to go with the cornerstone contract. Where are they from? Cornerstone in Norwood. Norwood. Yeah. All that kind of good stuff. Well, JMS has been doing a lot of that work for us over there, haven't they? Yeah, they've been coming in well. They've, they've been pretty, uh, pretty good. consistent. This, just so you know, this project isn't uh, straightforward as far as um, I'm really relying on each contractor to, uh, to install a system that will meet the needs of the legal, the legal uh, services people. So. In fairness to them, they're not all. We're not. We're talking about a similar concept, but because it's um, it's kind of a, a retrofit that um, there's different ways of doing it, and we didn't. We kind of left it up to the contractor to tell us um, how they would go about it, and that's why we just did the labor only, and then we would buy those materials that they need. We have an estimate of seven thousand dollars for the. Okay. So, um, um, and it was budgeted. We, I think, we had sixteen thousand dollars budgeted for HVAC uh, um, upgrades, and that's where we're going to use that money this year. Quite a big spread between those numbers, though. Yeah. yeah. Always makes me concerned when you see a guy at well, six and one at twenty-eight. And, and part of that was Hyde Stone had it, um, you know, probably more gold-plated um, uh, type of. Installation and, and they did use a contractor, so that's why I just wanted to. Um, okay. uh, I just would point out that First Class Air is an MWBE, but with this contract being under twenty-five thousand, we do not have to set MWBE goals. Uh, I believe if they were closer, we would have maybe made the recommendation differently. But with that <coughs> spread and with not having to set goals on this contract that the uh, cornerstone services is the best bit. Now if we, say if we were, our goal is 20%, say if we were at 5% or 6%, do you think we'd have, we'd have went with 
with that. We would have been more likely to, to that. have considered that much more strongly. Mm -hmm. uh, but but okay. because of where we are and because of the size of the contract and because of that spread, it really does make Cornerstone the best bid. How do you do that, Fred? Do you track that? Weekly, what your percentage is? We don't track it weekly or anything. I mean, we do have to report quarterly, but Karen and I know where it is most of the time. Where are we now? You have an idea? I think it depends on. Uh, I think I think where you are. I think we're weak in the first quarter because we haven't paid any insurance bills. So the juice through there, that's not figured in yet. It, it all, it, it's cash based. So it doesn't matter when you decide to do something, it's when you pay for it. Usually that is the way it works in the cash talks. Well, not talk. Usually in a, when you have accrual yeah. accounting, you would think it would be accrual based, but it's not, it's cash based. So you could be figuring what you got percentage wise, and really you don't have that percentage because they haven't paid the money. So we haven't paid yet, right. So you yes. could get overloaded yeah, that's right. Well, but I think we will be very weak in the first quarter. Timing is everything. Time is, Time timing is everything. If we well, I didn't realize the problem that right. you run into. What, yeah. you, what you just the bill comes in in June, we'll pay it. But and, and with that, we're so seasonal up here. We're not a round the clock. So, like, if I could get the inspection done in January and February, and, and that would help Fred out, we'd do it. But it seems like we do everything from middle of March <coughs> through 1st uh, of December. So all of those things, that fourth quarter, they're kind of fourth quarter things. Is the goal 20% for the year? Yes, yes. You report 20% no, per quarter. You report quarterly, but it's the goal is actually 20% of your, your funds, right? Yes. So we're on the accrual system. The state bases their deal on its cash system. The bases MWBE yeah. and cash. It just goes to show you that the well thought out plans of the state and driver. Now, real, yeah, yeah, those two systems, I'm not an accountant, now, but those two systems don't go quite like that. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> Cash is just what, what Fred is describing, and accrual is you recognize income when it's earned, rather, rather than when you receive it, and you recognize expenses yeah. as they're incurred. incurred. Right. A lot of people pick cash because then you don't get taxed and stuff you never collect. Yeah, you but then you have to make those other adjustments. Yeah, individuals basically not break down the cash. Yeah. So they are. It, it, along this uh, MWB thing, just quick, are they ever going to give you or give us or give everybody a a report on uh, uh, what everybody's done? These are these, these state agencies haven't met their goal, and we took X amount of dollars away from them, or anything like that. Is there any any report ever going to come, Fred? Of, of I'm 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 guessing that it's available if it's foiled, you know, about okay. what everybody right. has done. Yeah, we'll um, give it to you. I think you could probably find it on the website. We've been uh, concentrating solely on ourselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was just wondering down the road if they were ever going to say, you know. These in the last four years, this is where, you know, this is where we are. This is where the organizations are, uh, you know. I think oftentimes it's more of the attention is based on those that are not making it, not making it. and uh, we seem to be getting less attention. Yeah, uh, well, which is good. I mean, which is good. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yes. All right. There's more. It's more of a stick than a carrot. You know, <laughs> that yeah. you don't get gold stars, but you get. There's definitely something out there because they report on it. Let's ask our MWBE um, analyst uh, okay. off the record to send us something. I mean, there's got to be a record. I was just curious to see if, if somebody report. didn't make it, yeah. what they did to them, or, you know, or. Yeah, it should be nothing. Yeah, probably. Yeah, the thing that I always said when you're talking to Doug about it, because you look up there. Now, if we were really in a bind, the state would allow us to spend money on not the lowest bidder, just to meet a, a different artificial number for MWBE. Yes, to meet the, the public the, policy goals. Yeah. Yes. So, but in other words, you're supposed to not spend more money than you have to, but then again, to, for a policy goal, we can spend whatever we want to. To, to stretch that way out, if Hyde Stone was the, was the big winner, because and they were MWBE, and we really needed them, we could spend $22,000 more, and the state would say, oh, you guys did a wonderful job. <laughs> don't make sense. Yeah. In my the state just recently passed, and I don't know whether it's been signed, a 6% uh, usage of, of the veteran-owned 
organizations. So the, our goal may go up to 26 percent. <laughs> MWZ. The the yeah. 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 We knew it was coming. It was. We knew it was coming. We thought it was going at five percent. And I know it's past the six percent. Past the six percent. Makes you wonder what's next. Yes. You really want if the state itself complies with its own rules, I doubt it. <laughs> but they don't have they don't keep track of that. Any well that's a nice seven? bid. The real question is this is a nice bid. Yeah. Uh, I'll move this uh, down. Second. Hey, okay, I'll Aye. Aye. I'll move this to the full board. Okay, and the last thing uh, for today, let's uh, let's talk about this uh, handout here first. Um, the red line is the, the fiber optic that we're looking to have installed uh, by Dank in the industrial parks as part of a $100,000 uh, Northern Border Regional Commission grant. Um, let's go back and talk uh, original numbers. The grant was for $100,000 and anticipated an OBPA match. We had uh, fiber in the park. We needed to do an assessment on the fiber in the park. Some of our fiber is junk, some of our fiber is good. Uh, we did all in round numbers, about $10,000 worth of assessments there. Uh, Dank to install everything that uh, is uh, shown in the red line and then connect the good parts of our fiber which are shown in the black lines with the uh, white dots where it crosses the red. Or is up the majority of the park. Uh, the cost to do that, round numbers, is $150,000. So short answer, we're going to be on the hook for a little bit more than we thought on this project, uh, but in turn we get a better product than we thought we were going to get because of our existing wiring and the uh, taking advantage of tank services and the configuration of this new backbone. So what we did is we um, ran it down the poles on Proctor Avenue and then ran it right straight up through the utility corridor in, in the park. And uh, this part of the upside down T, if you will, is going to be buried. This part is on the existing poles. So I hope that's kind of a, a brief discussion. Who owns the black lines? What is that for? That's no, existing. black lines us. That's existing. Yep. Okay. That's the part of the uh, um, the part of the stuff that's in the park that's good. And if you'll notice, the, the red line is like a T. That was the Wade's idea. Because we were, I was kicking around different things there, but um, Dan came back with a couple different things that were kind of, uh, um, and, and Wade suggested that um, that you see the T going up through the middle, and that was kind of an aha thing for everybody, and it really saved us a lot of money. You'll notice we don't go to Building Nine. Um, we're just trying to get as much out of our money for our buildings, and Nine isn't that far off of the. Uh, main line where they can tie into that but we were just taking care of those things that we can control so that's kind of uh, the reason for that type of design is that where Derringer is? Uh, yeah. no Derringer is with a big D the white that's right there oh, oh excuse yeah. me no no, no. no they're nine now nine, nine. nine now yeah okay. the Fausto okay. with a big D yeah. and, it, um, and seven is we don't own that so rather than spend money for mm -hmm. um, that but I think Derringer I mean, they can hook off of 37. And I'm glad you mentioned that. A couple of key points here of what this, what this does do. It wires up DeFalsco for the expansion. It um, wires up um, T-based communications in Building 12, which has a need for this. Puts it in very close proximity to the uh, credit union, should they need it in the future. And also brings it right to Anson's back door. And this is a, a, a redundance to redundant system that will uh, provide maximum of functionality. And the other thing it does too, it wires up uh, building six, and that's important because we have that former social security space that's sitting over there, and to have uh, fiber connectivity in that, type of, in that type of space is just a natural fit. So it will knock on wood, it should make that uh, space more rentable. Steve, did I miss anything else in terms of the customer? Uh, no, I think uh, we just gave a, an overview of where we're headed with that design, but I think it takes care of most of uh, uh, the buildings that we control and, and some uh, supplemental buildings. 
Now, there's a space between 11 and 14. Uh, it's kind of like, I thought, if you look at the map north, it's kind of like uh, northeast. Well, that's our, our, our land, right? Are you here, Part of it, yes. Part of it, not all of it. Not all of it. Is there a plan, well, uh, to move up from that, a plan for this building at all in the future, or are we just too hard to get here? Well, this building what, what has uh, Time Warner. Uh, services. Oh, so we, so we're, we're, we don't need to get into that. Yeah, we're in de decent shape for right now, um, but should we have a you know a large tenant move in here and take over the whole bottom floor that needs uh, I don't know, let's say medical records or something okay. like that, that could that could change. Okay. But right now we've got uh, uh, easiest way to describe this is kind of like the difference between having a water main. Uh, a fire hose and a garden hose. Uh, right now we have a water main coming to this building. Uh, this thing is more like a uh, water uh, water main over in the industrial park for information flow. It's going to flush the toilet, right? So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't cross connect this. <laughs> yeah, don't cross <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think uh, my personal opinion is obviously uh, you know, move forward here with uh, technology as it should be yeah. for our clients and for everybody else in, in the park. Uh, no, I, think, uh, I think you all got this thing, so I appreciate your work on that. So this in uh, the agenda item itself would be an agreement between Ogdensburg Bridge and Port Authority and Development Authority of the North Country for 149487 to install this system in the industrial park. How soon would they do that? End of the year. Yeah. It'll be complete. Also, um, some of the uh, things of the contract would they, they would be under some of the same or some of the same goals that you know that we require. Um, they they would like bidding processes and things like that. So they would. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to explain that way, but um, you know what I'm saying. They. So with Dank using a third party to come in and install this stuff, it falls under Dank's uh, procurement policies and everything's taken care of there. So there's no MWBE requirements to worry about. Uh, nothing from our side of things. It's just a straightforward contract between us and uh, the development authority. And the additional money that we were talking about here were covered there? Yes. Through a contingency type of line on this. Yes, we can we can find the the money to cover the shortfall um, because we were originally thinking this is going to be a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar project. It's going to be a hundred and fifty thousand dollar project. So we'll, we'll, uh, we can adapt there. It's definitely worth uh, doing for the industry. Well, we actually need to have this over there if we're going to have business in one. It's critical because without it, it would be like putting an industrial building in a field with no road. Yeah. You, you've got to have it today in some It's a good illustration. Any other discussion? No. No, I'll move up. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And uh, Mr. Chairman, this concludes the uh, business before the facilities committee meeting at this time. Okay, so I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll move it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned.